um, very last section of our chapter 28, our four part series for chapter 28. Um, we're going to look at what's going to occur after after birth, as well as um, if I can remember. Um, lactation and some other things. I don't remember everything puts fullest, but we're dealing with everything that's gonna occur after um, after childbirth. Okay, so this word papirium, this is what occurs uh, the first weeks after postpartum. So after you've given birth, that first six weeks is called a papirium. Um, and it's a period during which the mother's anatomy and physiology starts to stabilize and reproductive organs start to return to its normal state. So everything is returning to normal. When we look at in, in, in um, involution, that's the shrinking of the uterus. So remember the uterus was this small at first, and then with the growth of this fetus, it increased to this length. So now it has to go back to its original size, and this is called involution. So the uterus loses about 50% of its weight in the first few weeks, for in the first week, sorry, in lactating women, so those women that are breastfeeding. And it is um, nearly, no not breastfeeding, sorry, this for in, in lactating women. And is nearly at its pre-gravid um, weight in week four, so maybe it's back, almost in, back to its original state prior to pregnancy that is called um, pre-gravid weight. That's pre-gravid, which is prior to um, pregnancy. About at four weeks, it returns to, it's nearly to its pre-pregnancy weight. Now, involution is achieved by self-digestion self of uterine cells by their own uh, lysosomes and li lysosomal enzymes. Now, for about 10 days, this produces a vaginal dis discard, a discharge called, um, uh, called lucai, 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 lu lucai, or lucai, I call it lucai. Now, it's usually bloody at first, but then it turns into a cirrhosis type of a fluid. Now, breastfeeding, as some may know, it helps to promote involution. Why? Because it suppresses the, the estrogen secretion and then it stimulates the oxytocin secretion, which is, which is pretty good. Now, it is important for the um, parperium to be un, in, undisturbed as emotional upset can inhibit lactation. So, what is lactation? Lactation is basically the synthesis and the ejection of milk from the mammary from the mammary glands. Now, it lasts for at least a week after postpartum in women who do not breastfeed their infants, but it will continue for many, many years, um, as long as the breast is stimulated by a nursing infant or any type of mechanical device such as a breast pump. So, you do have some infants, some women that do continue to breastfeed their children even up to age three. I do remember um, going to church one day and I had my infant with me and this lady had a three-year-old with her and she was still breastfeeding her child. So it is possible to still breastfeed. Now women traditionally nurse their infants until medium age of 2.8 years. I will say to say eight years. Of, I mean three years. So it is, I have seen it personally. So it's not just what the book says, i definitely seen it. Alright, so um, we do have, during pregnancy, we have a high estrogen level. And that causes the ducts of the mammary glands to grow and then branch off extensively, correct? So other hormones also contribute, such as the growth hormone, the insulin, the, um, the glucocortisol, and the prolactin. Now, other hormones also contribute. Sorry, no. Now, the progesterone, they start to stimulate the budding and the development of the acne at the ends of these ducts. Now, in late pregnancy, the mammary um, acne and the ducts are distended with a secretion called um, colostrum. 
And now, uh, this is very similar to breast milk in protein and lactose content. So they have, um, it's very similar to, to breast milk in that they have the, the protein and the lactose content. But they do not contain that one-third of fat. They have one-third less fat. So it's very similar. Now, um, it is an infant's own natural source of nutrition, nutrition for the first one to three days after birth. It has a thin watery con um, consistency and a cloudy yellowish color. It contains immunoglobulins, um, especially that IgA, and these may protect the um, neonate from gastroenteritis, which may be reabsorbed by the small intestines to confer um, any type of um, system-wide immunity. Now milk synthesis is promoted by prolactin which is a hormone from the anterior, an anterior pituitary gland. Now the prolactin secretion begins five weeks into pregnancy and by full term it is 10 to 20 times normal I mean to its normal level. It has little effect on the mammary glands until after birth when the levels of the steroids um, abruptly drop with the, dis with the discharge of the placenta. Now every time the infant nurses, the stimulation causes a surge of prolactin to 10 to 20 times um, normal for the next hour and milk is synthesized for the next feeding. Now these surges are accompanied by smaller increases in estrogen and progesterone secretions. Now, if the mother does not nurse or the surges are absent, the mammary glands stop producing milk in about a week. Now, even if the mother does milk, does nurse, milk production declines after seven to nine months. Now, nursing apparently inhibits this GNRH secretion and the ovarian cyclin. And only 5% to 10% of women become pregnant again while breastfeeding. It's a small amount, 5 to 10%. So it is still possible. Now, even women who breastfeed, however, the, the ovarian cycle continues. Uh, I'm sorry, it, it sometimes resumes several months postpartum. So here is just these little prolactin surgeons that occurs. This is pregnancy, this is after pregnancy, this is lactating phase and here are the different feedings and during feedings you have this surge of prolactin that is secreted. Okay. Alright, so milk, it doesn't going to flow easily into the ducts. The milk ejection or the milk letdown is controlled by the neuroendocrine reflex. So the infant's sucking on her nipple, it stimulates those nerve endings in the nipple as well as the areola, which in turn signals the hypothalamus and the, pituit the posterior pituitary gland to release that oxytocin. All right, so the slide changed just slightly. I wanted to add in this, I just added in this picture again. Um, but this is what they're, they're, this information is talking about when we talk about milk ejection um, reflex. When the infant is, is um, in the process of receiving milk from his mother, um, it stimulates these nerve endings that you'll find here in the nipple as well as the areola. This in turn is going to stimulate the hypothalamus, which is within the brain. It's going to stimulate the, the hypothalamus. Um, and the posterior pituitary gland right here to release this oxytocin. The oxytocin is then going to stimulate these myoepithelial cells which uh, form this basket-like net around each of the um, acne which are in here which we talked about in another video. These cells are going to contract like the smooth muscles to squeeze this milk out from the acinus into the ducts, even though they are not, even though they are um, of the epithelial origin. 
Now milk is going to fill these ducts and the latiferous sinus within 30 to 60 seconds of the child actually um, sucking on the brother on the mother's after of suckling sorry now the composition of the breast milk changes over the first two weeks it varies from um, from from one time a day to another and every changes during the course of the single feeding now cow's milk is not a good substitute for human milk I repeat, cow's milk is not a good substitute for human milk. It has one third less lactose, but three to five times as much protein and minerals. The large amount of protein, the the large amount of protein is not digested and absorbed as um, efficiently. It's not absorbed properly. And it also increases the infant's um, nitric, nitrogenous waste excretion, increasing the incidence and severity of a diaper rash. So please, no cow's milk. Don't do all this milk. Breast feed for all you females is very important. It's healthy for the baby as well. It helps in getting you back into shape quicker by shrinking, reducing the size of that uterus. All right. Colostrum and milk have a laxative effect that helps clear the neonatal intestine. It's that greenish black um, uh, fecal matter that accumulated during fecal development. Now by clearing the bile and Bilirumin from the neonatal body, breastfeeding reduces the incidence and degree of jaundice in neonates. There's another reason why you need to breastfeed. Breast milk promotes um, colonization of the neonatal intestines with beneficial bacteria and continues to supply antibodies. Breastfeeding also tends to promote um, a closer bond between the mother and the infant. Not there yet. Now, a woman nursing one day, uh, a woman nursing one baby generally produces about 1.5 liters of milk per day. A woman with twins, obviously, she's going to produce a lot more. Now, lactation it it places a greater metabolic demand on the mother who loses 50 grams of fat, 100 grams of lactose, and 2 to 3 grams of calcium per day. You want to lose that adipose tissue. You don't want it lingering around. You want to look good on that beta suit again. Okay, so a woman is at a greater risk of bone loss when breastfeeding than when she is pregnant because the infant skeletal system becomes mineralized during the first year of postpartum. So yes, there's a downside, but if you are consuming the proper amount of food, the proper quanti quality of food, it will not decrease too much. But still, there are other benefits. All right, so let's look at methods of contraception, which is the very last, last. Oh, oh sorry, which is the very last um, area that we're going to look at. When we look at contraception. Contraception. Um, any procedure or device intended to prevent pregnancy. We have behavioral methods, which is abstinence. Um, rhythm method, which is periodic abstinence. Uh, withdrawal. Now, we have certain barriers for male and female. We have the condom, the diaphragm, and the sponge. And then we have these spermicides, as foams, creams, gels, jellies. Uh, we do have hormonal methods. Um, we do have that after the morning after pill where you may feel that you have been that that um, You may be pregnant and you catch it very early. You you can actually get these in the store. I believe um, It's a high dose of estrogen and progesterone alone and it induces menstruation if implantation 
has not occurred. Now, it inhibits ovulation, it inhibits movement of sperm and an egg, and inhibits implantation. Then you have this other pill here, this RU486, progesterone antagonist, which induces abortion up to two months into pregnancy. So these are the different hormonal methods. You have the pill, which is your estrogen and progesterone. You have the patch, the in injection, or you have the um, um, vaginal ring. Then you have these other devices. You have an IUD, an intrauteral device. This is what it looks like. It's inserted in during your visit to your doctor and it has a little string at the end that is left in place. So um, I guess periodically they'll go in and check the string to see if it's still there. If it's not too short, not too long. Um, make sure it's not interfering with anything. It's inserted through the, through the cervix into the vagina and you see how it blocks off any sperm from getting past here and into the um, fallopian tubes or even meeting up with the egg. Okay. Um, we have um, surgical sterilization which is clamping. We have clamping of the uterus, not the uterus, sorry, clamping of the fallopian tubes or clipping of these tubes. Oh, it's on there twice. I'm sorry. Here we go. Here it is. Here, here are your fallopian tubes, and you have you have a cut and tie procedure where they um, tie the the fallopian tubes, and then they cut in between. You have a sealed where they cauterize the area. They have a um, a band, a plastic band that they used, and then they have um, a block using a clip. They usually clip it here. So there are different ways of of, steril, of surgical sterilization. So methods of contraception. Failure rates of contraceptive methods. Here we have the rate of failure pregnancy pregnancies per 100 uses. No protection. Uh, perfect use. You have 85 out of 100 users. The rhythm method, 3 to 5. Who would be the lowest? Well, abstinence would definitely be the lowest. But we have, but it's been dealing with contraception. Tubal ligation, you have a 0 0.5. That's basically tying of the tubes, what another term, layman terms. Um, birth control pill, the patch, or the U, the uva ring, you see them down at um, 0 0.3 to 0.5. And the IUD, the intrauteral device, is actually pretty low at 0.2 to 0.6 percent well of the 100 users have failed so this one would actually be the best device to use than the birth control patch or the uva ring but don't forget with every single one of these methods you do have side effects so if for those females that are thinking of using um, contraceptive methods Make sure you read the side effects males. Make sure you encourage your females to engage. And if you do want them to use it, make sure you um, you both know the side effects, the pros and cons of all methods. All right, so that is all for chapter for this last section. It's very short. If you have any questions, let me know, and I'll be willing to ask any questions, answer any questions. All right, have a good one. Make sure you study for the test.